on that. Um, the problem with being my friend is that I only ever give two kinds of advice. Uh, one of those uh, bits of advice is dump him. <laughs> <laughs> Works 90% of the time. <laughs> and the other is quit your job. Uh, Anand mentioned to me uh, yesterday that these are really just like, th this is the same kind of advice. This is all about <laughs> uh, taking back your own uh, responsibility for your own freedom. And it only really works, to be fair, when people are already prepared to dump him or quit their job, and they just need to hear it from somebody else. Statistically, I think some of you probably need to hear to quit your job and start your own business. So today, is, for me, is all about like scaling this advice to uh, reach a wider number of people. Um, before I tell you how you should do it and why and um, why I did it, I want to set. Um, I want to sort of put it a little bit in perspective. Um, <laughs> this is a quote from an artist I greatly admire, Ingrid Berington. She's an artist and a writer, and I, I want you to notice that I put it in a really friendly typeface. <laughs> I wanted to soften the message a little bit. Um, there's a finite amount of time we have on this planet. Uh, you have a finite number of days and hours, and your loved ones also do. And the time is, we spend doing stuff is not replaceable. We don't get to take it, like, have it back. Uh, I will never be this young again, and neither will be my friends. And um, that was sort of part of the reason why I wanted to start my own company. Um, it's because. I was really sick of having a job. Um, my job, uh, the last job I had, uh, was actually not too bad. Um, it, it was pretty sweet in a lot of ways. But there was an unspoken expectation that uh, in my, on my private social media, I would uh, sort of act as an ambassador for the company, that I would somehow represent the company uh, in the things that I do outside of work. And there was also some unspoken pressure to attend meetups and represent the company uh, at meetups and events. Um, and I resisted those expectations successfully, uh, but I didn't enjoy having to set boundaries. And it made me think that, for me, that line has already been crossed, that you cannot expect me to give up my spare time to do things that are work-related. Re work and it really bothered me that somebody had the power to even make me have to establish those boundaries. Uh, essentially, jobs are a lottery. I know that some of you probably have amazingly supportive jobs, uh, supportive companies that you work for, you have amazing coworkers, people who make accommodations for uh, things that you need to do your job properly, and that's amazing. But a lot of jobs that people have are actually really shit. Um, or you might be uh, going into an interview and you know uh, everything's amazing, the company seems great, the job, the work is interesting, uh, you join and it's amazing, you know, sparkles and butterflies. And uh, over time that changes because you don't actually have any control over you know, how these things change over time. So you might think that you uh, sort of join in this situation which is really working for you, but like suddenly find yourself in this new world that has totally changed around you. And that was something that I also felt like, well, I didn't really have enough control over these things. And the third thing that really bothered me was that I don't really want to perform passion. Um, I'm not actually passionate about my job, and it feels a little bit radical to say it out loud. I don't work evenings and weekends. Uh, I don't code uh, up until 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, nothing I do at work is ever an actual emergency that requires immediate attention. Uh, the expectation that I must be somehow passionate about my job, to be really good at it and to be really competent, uh, just makes me cringe. It's just so unnecessary. Uh, so I felt like I wanted to live in a world that didn't have those stupid expect uh, stupid sorry didn't have those expectations that I found unreasonable, um, and I wanted to sort of have control over like what those expectations were. Um, I actually want to do a slight detour uh, because my work is extremely creative and I assume that uh, since you work in the tech industry, you also probably see your work as very creative. 
I want to talk a little bit about um, how creativity actually happens in the human mind and what are the prerequisites for it in order to sort of help you understand why I think um, change in like how you do work is really important. While I was still at university, I read this amazing book by Margaret Bowden, who's uh, a leading cognitive and um, computer science researcher. And she wrote the whole book, The Creative Mind, about how creativity actually occurs. And there are three main ingredients for that, so three um, ingredients that are required in order for you to have new ideas. The first is that you have to have some kind of problem you're working on. There's something you're trying to solve and you're already thinking about something really deeply. The second is that you need to feed your mind all sorts of new experiences. You need to read books, watch films, go new places, try different food, do interesting things, talk to new people, have all these novel things feeding into your mind. And this is the material from which your mind creates new ideas because it takes the problem that you're working on and it takes all those new ingredients and stuff, mashes them together. Um, and this is a diagram of how ideas are actually produced and I think it's actually uh, scientifically accurate. Uh, the sort of uh, free association occurs only when you're in a state of relaxation. Uh, so it only occurs when you're not specifically working on your problem, but when you're sort of relaxed and you're sort of daydreaming and you have all these cool things in your head and suddenly your mind starts making new connections. This is why people often say that they have amazing ideas in the shower because being in the shower is quite conducive to actually enter in this relaxed state. So how do you replicate that relaxed state every single day from nine to five uh, in any given job? Well, it's actually really difficult. And for me personally, it's extremely difficult if I don't have the time to do the things that I am actually passionate about, which are those things. I absolutely <laughs> love spending time with my partner and my friends and my family, eating food, knitting, sewing, doing all these kinds of things. And like, this is the kind of stuff I care about when I'm on my deathbed this is the kind of stuff I'm going to be thinking about and thinking like, wow, I'm so happy I've done all of these amazing things. I'm not going to be thinking, you know, I wish I'd replied to more email or replied to it faster. <laughs> <laughs> so given how fleeting life is and that neither of us strives to respond to more email, I wanted to have a work situation that I would be really comfortable with and that never coerced me into doing the stuff that I didn't want to do. Um, I also wanted to have more creative control. If you think about sort of uh, any kind of project, it sort of starts in a sort of uh, a pot early stage point where like nothing's really uh, defined yet, and it's sort of ideas sort of meander and move around, and everything's sort of still up for grabs. And eventually, you sort of start reaching some kind of clarity, and by the end, you have an outcome. And I used to be invited to participate on projects sort of at this late stage where ideas have already been defined and um, you know, people just ask me like, oh, can you now just like build this thing that we thought of? And that was often fun, but I wanted to be involved at that stage before things are already defined and before we know what it is that we're actually going to make. Uh, luckily, I was sharing an office um, with uh, my friend, Dan Williams, and it turns out that Dan had really similar ideas about what he wanted from his work in life. He also didn't want to have to work evenings and weekends, and we wanted to work on similar kinds of projects, and we have very similar history, um, and we sort of like the, kind, the same kind of work. So we decided to uh, team up and start a company and do the kind of work that we want to do and do it the way we think is appropriate. Um, so we started a tiny consultancy, Buckley Williams, a uh, very cool name. Uh, we spent so long trying to come up with this unique name, but uh, if we ever do grow, it's going to become a little bit of a problem. Um, but we aim for a 35-hour work week. We take plenty of time off. When either of us feels ill, we just go home. Uh, if one of us wakes up in the morning and feels like, I don't really want to deal with anything today. We just stay home, you know? Like, our well-being doesn't stand in the way of our ambition because those things are not in opposition. And we do things like this. This is like a speculative object, uh, an inter internet-connected radio we made uh, for uh, someone we know, which plays ambient uh, notifications to them every 15 minutes. And it's sort of all about personalized notifications delivered by audio, but in a passive way where you don't request information from kind of some kind of third party services, but they sort of arrive continuously um, and don't require your active participation. 
Uh, last year, we also worked on a project for a charity called The Everyone uh, with uh, another design partner called Projects by If, where we build uh, sort of prototypes of um, collaborative health record system that uh, visualized how health records could be communicated to patients and clinicians in the UK. Um, currently, most patients don't, can't actually access the um, health records right now, or uh, the access is actually quite difficult. So it was about trying to influence policymakers to uh, do the things necessary to um, change how those records are shared with patients. Um, so for us, the company was sort of used to achieve multiple goals. One was to have a sensible work-life balance, but the other was also to like work on the kinds of projects that we wanted to work on. Um, and I want to show you a, a few more examples of like people and companies who have used this sort of idea of a company or a business <coughs> as like a tool for something really interesting, either external change or some kind of internal benefit. Um, Projects by IF that we've worked on uh, on the projects I just sh showed you a moment ago was funded by Sarah Gold. Uh, the studio is, um, th the goal is to change how uh, big corporations and organizations think about privacy and digital rights and then do it in two ways. One is they provide consultancy to those organizations and work with them to think about various implications of new technologies. And the second is they build projects like this. So they make... Um, so projects that help people understand how would certain uh, products or communications look if people actually thought about like digital rights and privacy. So this was their project where they um, built a tiny prototype that at the point of sale explained to you security risks involved in purchasing uh, internet uh, connected products. They also did another project that was to do with uh, asking um, asking people for private information and informing them about how that information is going to be stored and shared and with whom and how long that sharing is going to last. So to sort of help people make trade-offs about whether they want to share certain information or not. Um, so they're changing the world sort of externally and using a, a for-profit business uh, in order to be able to do that. Um, Field Train is, an is a company founded by Courtney Stanton and Darius Kazemi, and they wanted to make a workers' co-op. They realized that you know they don't really uh, like how in capitalist systems people are being um, exploited by the companies they work for. So in their mind, making a, a company that is a wor workers-owned uh, was the only way to sort of counteract that. Uh, and they've also decided that. Uh, the company can never grow larger than eight people because uh, in their minds, that's like the maximum size of a company you can have where people like communicate directly and make decisions together. Um, so that was, to me, really interesting. And it reminded me that in the 70s, um, a design firm called Pentagram was founded in London, I think, by uh, a number of designers who valued their independence but also realized that working for a larger company brings with itself certain kinds of uh, benefits. So, for example, there might be shared uh, HR costs or like certain kinds of processes that uh, larger companies have figured out, but as an independent practitioner, you don't really have. So they got together, pulled legal and other resources, and they sort of act as a firm of um, equal partners uh, who are still nevertheless have that sort of independence within that larger organization. Um, so to me, those are really uh, powerful examples of what can be done uh, if you just let your, let your imagination roam wild. So why should you quit your job and start a company? Well, first of all, because you're amazing and you can do it. Secondly, because your ideas are incredibly valuable. There's already a huge saturation of certain kinds of voices out there and certain kinds of companies are talked about a lot more. Um, certain narratives about businesses get told or how people start those businesses and how those businesses succeed. In fact, even under in, you know, uh, the constraints of capitalism, it's possible to have infinite variety of different businesses and different approaches. So uh, the ideas you have about how power should be constructed within those businesses are extremely valuable and unless you go and try it and do it, then we don't get to benefit culturally. Um, if you start your own business, you literally are the boss. 
and therefore you can do whatever the hell you want. You're in charge. <laughs> like, I don't understand why, uh, why this, th that just doesn't seem like the most amazing thing in the world. If you want four day week, you have it. Uh, you want to have a rule where everybody wears pink on Fridays? Great. Um, you want to decide that Jira is not allowed in your company? <laughs> that is literally up to you. Um, all of these choices are yours to make. Uh, you literally control your own destiny. How many times have you been in a company where somebody, uh, you know, one of your superiors made decisions that you disagreed with and those decisions resulted in bad outcomes and you, could, you foresaw those outcomes? In your own company, that's over. You make the decisions and you get to figure out how to get to where you want to be. You also get to decide what is success to you. And I think this is really important. To some people, success is like... Uh, full obliteration of competition and destruction of the planet. But maybe for you, uh, you might have some more human scale goals. Uh, <laughs> being ambitious doesn't necessarily mean that you have to follow other people's ambitions. Your ambitions might be like extremely amazing and huge to you and seem like amazing achievements, but they don't have to match to how the rest of the world thinks about what it means to achieve something. You're free to make your own rules about that. And to me and Dan, like, this is success. Like, having the time to go home and enjoy our lives and live our lives to the fullest, like, and having the space to not think about work, like, that's success. Uh, if you start your own business, you decide what matters. So you decide how you make decisions, you know? You can decide, like, we want to be the company that values the environment above all, and therefore, like, that's how you make the decisions. Or you can decide that you value inclusion above all the other things, and, like, that factors into how you make decisions or hiring processes or whatever. Like, you get to embody your values in the world through, like, processes that um, you build your company with. And finally, you have all the creative control. Not just over like, the actual work stuff that you think of creative, or as, of, of, as creative already, but like, the whole project of like, making a business and making a successful business is a very creative endeavor, and it's sort of up to you how to, how to do that. Um, if there's one thing I want to say about like, this sort of divide between like, the real work and the, like, all the other stuff that we do in our jobs, if you start your own business, the sort of hi pyramid of hierarchy looks a bit like this. There's the work work, in which in dance, and my case, is like the design and the, um, the coding and all that stuff that goes into like producing like <coughs> tangible outputs. And then there's like all of the relationships that you need to have in order to like make your business successful. You have to do a lot of like creating and maintaining relationships with people, finding out how like, other people do things, like finding, out, finding advice, like, ma doing sales and things like that. Like, all of that stuff takes up a lot of time, but it's extremely rewarding. So, if you are going to do your own thing, how do you do that? First of all, make a plan. Uh, decide who you're going to get work from uh, in the short term, medium term, and long term what kind of clients you want to have, what kind of products you're going to build, other like, any in intermediate goals that you need to have in order to like, take you to where you want to be in the future, which right now might not be exactly achievable. Secondly, get paid and actually double it. Uh, it's so important that it's worth saying it twice. Like, you have to learn to value yourself and value your time. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I received before I went freelance was from uh, somebody I did work experience with, and he said that I had to like immediately double my day rate because if my day rate's low, then people won't value my work, and it will be much harder to get work. So it's extremely important that like you don't work for free and that you don't like you know work for exposure or whatever. Like make sure you get paid. Uh, I am not ashamed to say that I love money and get it paid. <laughs> <laughs> and you should be too. Um, value your time. Um, starting a business is really fun and you get to learn a lot of stuff, but you also can't learn everything. At some point, you have to realize that there's a limit to the hours you have in the day 
and there's a limit to what you can realistically learn. So if there are things you want to learn because you think they'll be useful, that's amazing. But there are lots of stuff you, it might not be worth learning yourself. Um, so it, it's worth outsourcing everything that you feel like it's not worth for you. Like it's not worth you picking up the skill, learning it, doing it really slowly, uh, instead just pay somebody else to do it. Uh, pay an accountant. Um, Pay a lawyer to do your contracts. Pay like people who are much better at doing certain kinds of things that you find necessary uh, and just free up your time to do the thing that you're really good at. And also, like, don't procrastinate at work. Like, one uh, sort of like, key part of going home on time for me is that like, at work, I work, and outside of work, I don't work. Um, find mentors, because you're going to need advice. And um, Dan and I both found like, uh, two kinds of mentors. Some of the people we spoke to and got advice from were people who have already run their own businesses, who might have run some similar businesses, who had like, you know, sage advice to give us. But we also found people who, like us, have only just started and they are experiencing what we're experiencing right now. And they also have amazing advice to give us, even though they might not be more experienced. Um, it's also extremely important to like give yourself space to reflect and check in on yourself and check in on how you're doing. Celebrate how far you've come. Congratulate yourself on your accomplishments. Give yourself the time to do that. Learn from your mistakes. Uh, regularly review, like, is this still what I want to be doing? Is this where I wanted to be by now? Like, you know, it's really important to like make that time so you can course correct if necessary. And lastly, just do it. Really do it. <laughs> and I think you get the message right now. <laughs> I just want to leave you with two references for inspiration. First one is uh, a book uh, titled In the Company of Women. Uh, it's um, Grace Bonney's interviewing uh, lots of really cool women who have, like, who run all sorts of businesses from one person to like large businesses talk about what inspires them how they went about it what kind of advice they wish they knew when they started it's really an amazing inspirational resource and the second one um it's called woeful podcast uh, and it's hosted by Ashley Yosling, uh, who talks to uh, mostly women who started uh, yarn related businesses or fiber related businesses uh, and it's extremely interesting because all of them sort of grow out of like that need to somehow either change their working lives or change or make sure the work fits around their lives. And they all went about it in completely different ways and they have completely different structures. And there's just like such enormous variety in like why people do this and how they do this. So if you're ever stuck for inspiration, that's an amazing resource. And thank you.